Hi, it's Katrina. From houses literally in the middle of the road to the real life house from up, here are 11 homeowners who refuse to move. Number 11, the house in the middle of a road. Luo Baogen and his wife watched as all their neighbors moved out after accepting relocation compensation from the Chinese government. However, the couple felt the compensation would not be enough to rebuild a new home. So they refused and continued to live in their home in the city of Wingling in the Zhejiang province. In China, it is illegal to demolish a property without agreement from the tenants. This left the developers in a bind. They needed to build the highway which leads to the Winling railway station, but they couldn't force the couple out, so they reached a compromise. Most of the rooms around their apartment have been left untouched while the rest of the complex was demolished. Then the road was built around them, turning the remains of the complex into the world's strangest island. After quite the holdout, they finally agreed to sell it for 260,000 yuan, about $37,000. Number 10. The Thirsty Beaver The Thirsty Beaver Saloon on Central Avenue in Charlotte, North Carolina is owned by two brothers named Mark and Brian Wilson. They opened the business in 2008 on a property that has been owned by their landlord, George Salem's family, for over 70 years. In 2013, owners of the adjacent property began closing in on the Thirsty Beaver with chain-link fences, and it soon became clear that developers wanted the land the bar sits on. But while many other businesses in Charlotte have closed or moved in recent years in the face of the area's rapid development, the Wilson brothers in Salem joined forces. They agreed that they would stand united in their refusal to sell or relocate. The land surrounding the Thirsty Beaver sold for a whopping $8.5 million in 2015 to CW Development, and the company tried numerous times to also acquire the Thirsty Beaver property. Eventually, they realized that the saloon was there to stay and made plans to develop a five-story apartment building around the modest one-story bar. Although Salem has managed to hang onto his property, the Thirsty Beaver's future is not guaranteed. CW Development could, and someday might, seek to acquire the land through eminent domain and use it as a green space. But for now, they are holding off, and this comes as welcome news to their many regulars. Number 9. Toronto's Half House in downtown Toronto along St. Patrick Street, which was once Dummer Street, is a house that looks like it was literally cut in half. And that's because it was. The half house was built sometime between 1890 and 1893 and was one of six identical structurally connected row houses in a neighborhood that at that time was greatly affected by poverty and considered kind of a slum. During the mid-20th century, real estate developers began buying up properties in the neighborhood, and its landscape began to rapidly transform. But one owner, the Valkus family, was not interested in any financial offers and remained firmly planted at their residence. Slowly and one by one, five of the six row houses were demolished until 54 and a half was the only one left standing. It's amazing that the construction workers were able to be so precise. One wrong move and the house would be gone. It's pretty impressive how cleanly cut it looks. Time has undoubtedly taken a toll on the half house, which shows obvious signs of wear and tear. The daughter of the Valkos family passed away in 2017. Now it's reportedly privately owned, but it doesn't look like anyone lives there. And now for number eight, but first it's shout out time. Nerd Warehouse said, I love your videos. You do a great job narrating. Can I get a shout out? Well, of course, and here it is. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button so we can make it to 3 million subscribers. We're so close. Number eight, the Figo House. When an attorney who specializes in commercial litigation received news that a college wanted to take possession of the historic house he uses for his law practice, he made it clear that he wouldn't back down without a fight. In 2005, Oregon attorney Randall Acker bought and set up headquarters at the Figo House, a Victorian home that was built in 1894 and later transformed for business use. The property is conveniently located at the southern edge of downtown Portland, making it a great place for Acker's law practice. It's easily accessible by public transportation and near a freeway, and well, he likes the place. There's something to be said for these historic buildings, Acker told the Oregonian in 2011. So what happened was, in 2007, a local transportation authority called TriMet told him it needed the property for public transportation uses and was considering taking it through eminent domain. They had already offered to buy it after demolishing several neighboring homes, but Acker refused to sell. 
Acker and his firm fought to keep the property by investigating TriMet's intentions for it. See, don't mess with lawyers. They learned that the company planned to transfer some of its acquired land to Portland State University for the construction of a dormitory. Meanwhile, Acker launched a Save the Figo House campaign and compared his situation to the Disney movie Up. He got a lot of media coverage and his persistence finally paid off in 2008 when TriMet dropped its plans to acquire the Figo House and proceeded with commercial development on the surrounding property in partnership with PSU. Now you can see a 16-story college dorm was erected around the Figo House. Acker and his former adversaries remained peaceful with each other throughout the battle and after his victory, and he continues operating his practice out of the Figo House, where he coexists harmoniously with his neighbors. Number 7. Dean South In 2004, the 240-home Dean South housing development in Livingston, West Lothian, Scotland, was condemned and slated for demolition due to the use of concrete that was deemed inadequate for supporting the houses. Yikes. A development company struck up a deal with the West Lothian Council to acquire the neighborhood, which was built in the 1960s as council housing. In exchange for their homes, the company would offer compensation to homeowners and relocate them. But the deal is contingent upon getting all residents on board, and 15 years later, 10 households continue to reject compensation offers, which they say aren't enough. The rest of the homes sit vacant in what has become a ghost town. In 2011, the local authority attempted to acquire a compulsory purchase order and failed. Going forward, unless all the residents can reach an agreement, trying once more to buy the property by force may be the council's only choice. Number 6. China's Nail Houses Nail houses are homes that appear wildly out of place as homeowners resist moving despite construction projects encroaching on their properties. Some people refuse to leave their homes no matter how much money they're offered, so developers just build around them. These lonely-looking houses that stick out like a sore thumb are called nail houses because they stick out like a nail that can't be hammered down. In 2015 in Hunan province, China road construction was underway, but the owner of this three-story house absolutely refused to move. There was an argument about compensation, so construction came to a halt. He felt like he could hold out for more money, and meanwhile the rest of the road was completed. Another family in Shanghai also resisted for 14 years as they battled with the relocation authority. Their three-story house was also in the middle of a very busy road. The four lanes reduced to two lanes to go around the house. The owner said the family paid a big price for standing their ground. They suffered psychological pressure as well as noise, dust, and safety risks. Their home was officially demolished in 2017. Number 5. Café Chez Salah there is one solitary building left in the old Robai neighborhood in northern France. It's the Café Chez Salah, a coffee house whose owner, Salah Ujani, refuses to sell. Despite receiving numerous offers, Ujani, who's in his late 70s, sees no reason to part ways with the triangular structure, which once sat at an intersection that no longer exists. Ujani and his wife migrated from Algeria to France in 1949 and purchased the café in 1965. Back then, Robai was a bustling neighborhood filled with people of many professions and from various walks of life. Stepping into the cafe is like traveling back to that time with its dated decor and a jukebox that plays era-appropriate music. The neighborhood eventually declined and starting in 2000, its properties began to be sold. Ujani's parcel is the last holdout and it's located precisely at the axis of an intended residential development which plans to house 240,000 residents. Developers held out hope they could convince the man to sell, but eventually learned that it simply wouldn't happen. So they incorporated his cafe into their project. As for Johnny, he continues to run the cafe, despite occasional utility cutoffs and unreliable garbage service. Number 4. Edith Macefield House In 2006, developers offered Edith Macefield $1 million for her small 1,000-square-foot home in Seattle, Washington. Her refusal to sell made national headlines, and her house became known as the Real House from Up. Construction moved forward, and the mall was simply built around her little property. The foreman of the construction project, Barry Martin, befriended Edith. He helped her with her groceries, medications, and took care of her until she died in 2008 of pancreatic cancer. She was 86. In the end, she left her home to Barry Martin. Upon her death, he searched the home looking for clues of Edith's past, but only came up with more questions. She had written several books where she claimed she was a spy in World War II and had escaped from a concentration camp and rescued 13 children. 
She had a notebook full of autographs and several marriage certificates from different countries. While Martin sold it to the developer, they decided to keep the house and possibly rent it out to use as a shop, event space, or a restaurant. According to its Facebook page, the mildew-ridden Macefield house still stands. Edith's legacy, however, doesn't end here. Every year in Seattle since 2013, there has been a festival called the Macefield Music Festival to celebrate the memory of one determined and mysterious woman. Number 3. Grand Hotel Victoria The city of Amsterdam underwent a major construction boom between 1827 and 1921. During that time, the Amsterdam Central Railway Station was built. To make things more convenient for visitors and residents alike, plans were made for the construction of a hotel near the train station. German architect J.F. Henkenhoff drew up the plans for what would become the Grand Hotel Victoria. The glamorous hotel would be built on a city block opposite the train station and would be the first building in Amsterdam with electricity entirely throughout, including in the individual rooms. Its windows would be double-layered to block out noise from the nearby trains. To make room for the luxury building, developers bought up properties at the planned site, paying generous prices. To their surprise, however, two property owners refused to sell, hoping for higher offers. But after trying to negotiate for several years, the frustrated builders got fed up with the homeowner's greed and simply built the hotel around the two small houses. The Grand Hotel Victoria opened in 1890 and remains in business today, and the two houses, which date back to 1602, are also still standing. Both of the homes, which are now souvenir shops, belong to the heirs of the owners who refused to sell. Number 2. Stott Hall Farm Britain's six-lane M62 highway passes between Lancashire and Yorkshire along the Pennine Mountains. It eventually splits into eastbound and westbound lanes with a 100-foot wide median between. Located on the small patch of grass is the Stott Hall Farmhouse, representing the UK's only farm in the middle of a highway. When plans to build the highway were made in the 1970s, the farm's tenant, Ken Wilde, refused to vacate, even in the event of a compulsory purchase order. As the story goes, the roads engineers eventually caved to the man's characteristic Yorkshire stubbornness and divided the highway into two so it would go around the house. The 2,500-acre farm outside of the highway is connected to the house via two tunnels that were built underneath the road. Over 1,400 sheep graze on the property where they've pastured since 1737. In recent years, a documentary revealed that whether or not the farmer was truly the reason for the highway split, the farmhouse was allowed to stay where it is due to a geographic fault. The current tenant claims that the land sandwiched between the highway is too steep to have supported the roadway. Number 1. Spiegel Halter's Jewelry Store In what BBC reporter Justin Parkinson referred to as the British equivalent of the Chinese nail house, Spiegel Halter's is an old shop that has evaded demolition not once, but twice over the last 90 years. The 19th century storefront is located on East London's Mile End Road and was once a jewelry and clock shop. It survived the first attempt at demolition during the 1920s, when the owner stubbornly refused to close up shop. At the time, the neighboring businesses, Wickham's department store, had purchased several buildings on both sides of Spiegelhalters. Wickham's made an offer to buy out and demolish Spiegelhalters so they could use the space for an even grander storefront. But the Spiegelhalters had already moved once back in 1892 to accommodate the growing business, and they'd had enough. The owners refused to move yet again and vowed to stay firmly in place no matter how much money Wickham's offered them for the space leaving Wickham's with no choice but to build around the Spiegelhalter shop. As a result, Wickham's ended up with an asymmetrical store and a central tower that was actually off to the side. Nearly nine decades later, in 2015, Spiegelhalter's once again narrowly avoided demolition. At the time, it had long sat neglected in an ever-worsening shape since its closure in 1982. That year, someone launched a Change.org campaign to preserve the building as a symbol of individual triumph over corporate bullying after plans to replace the building with a glass atrium were revealed. Less than 3,000 people signed the petition, but their voices were heard. Although Spiegelhalters is no longer in use, it will remain standing, and proposals have been made for its renovation. Thanks for watching! Would you sell your house, or would you hold out like these people did? Let me know in the comments below, and while you're at it, be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family. See you next time! Bye!